Morning. Morning. My name's Randy. I'm one of the pastors here, and welcome to Seattle. It's great to have you guys here. Doesn't it feel like Seattle? Wow. If you're watching online, we really are in Fort Collins, Colorado, and we welcome you. Good to see everybody. I was gone last week because my granddaughter that was born really early at 26 weeks turned one year old, and uh, man, that was fun. She is the chubbiest of all my grandkids. How does that happen when you're born that early? And she, she is so happy. I think that w once you go through the NICU for three months, the rest of life is easy. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, thank you. So, hey, you guys, uh, if, if you're new here, we're going through something as a church that we're going to call a journey to abundance. And this journey is our journey of actually selling this building. We found out that we had like four to six million dollars worth of, of uh, repairs that we need to do. And frankly, we don't have that kind of money. And I'm not going to ask you guys to, to give that kind of money. I know a couple of you could just write a check tomorrow, but um, no, I don't think so. I don't think we have that. Um, so, so what happened was we just sold our building to Mill City Church, which is a much larger church that's been, uh, Rue, can you get that ring out of there? Thanks. Um, Mill City Church has been kind of living at, uh, CSU for some time, and it's been kind of tough for them. So they're, they're purchasing our church, and we are going to move to Timnath. Timnath, yeah. I don't know if you guys knew this. Timnath only has two churches right now in a town that is one of the fastest growing areas in Colorado. And for, for a guy that loves going where no man has gone before, uh, I get really fired up about that because we're going to be right off of I-25 and Harmony, just, just a little bit off of there, okay? And so we're, we're kind of going through five stages. The first stage was praying and deciding, God, what are you doing? And frankly, I don't know if you've ever heard of that poem called Butt Prints in the Sand instead of Footprints in the Sand. Like, the butt prints is the picture of me being pulled along by God uh, to this decision and, and uh, me kicking and screaming the whole way because I love this building. But he really led us to the place of really seeing that this is where we want to be, that this is what God wants to do with us. And it's been him initiating it, not us. Okay? Now we're in the prep and planning stage. And right now we're just preparing to sell this building. We're going to close probably in June or July. And then, guys, we just found out it's going to take six months for our in-between building to be completed. Uh, man, which means it's construction, right? So it'll be maybe eight months. Um, we don't know, but it's going to take a while. So we're going to try and rent here from Mill City for a while. But our goal is to be a church on mission. What this is going to enable us to do is to see every member seeing themselves as influencers in their world. And we're going to see lots of people be transformed by the Holy Spirit working through you. Okay? That's what our goal is. We want to be an influential church that just loves people to Jesus. So, once, once we get through this stage, we're going to launch and we're going to do what I call camping. Okay? We don't know what we're going to do. Uh, look, when Moses led the people out into the desert, he was clueless as to where they were headed. Okay, so we're going to be led by the Holy Spirit, and we'll see what happens. Then we'll be in the great in-between. That's where we'll be at this, at this gym out in Timnath, 
called Studio 68. We've purchased it and, uh, and we're gonna transform it into a cool church building. Um, not transforming it into a church, you're the church, okay? It'll be a church building. And then we're gonna go into uh, a time of growing and thriving. So we've, we've got several steps and in this, this coming fall, I'm gonna do a series on, uh, on journeying out of Egypt to the promised land. So just so you know that, okay? Um, so guys, I, I need to tell you, my next series is gonna start after Mother's Day and it's gonna be called, Let's Get Coffee. And, and this series is for you to be able to ask any question you want to ask about the Bible or culture, and we're going to see if we can answer it. Okay? So that'll go all summer. So uh, Ed's, Ed's amazing. You know, he's the QR code king, and, and he'll have a QR code for you to go to, and it'll probably be on that app. And all you have to do is ask your question. It'll be anonymous. We won't know who asked it. And it'll be fun because we'll, you know, we'll ans ask, answer all your questions as best as we can. Yeah. All right. Hey, we are on our last, second to last week of sit, walk, stand. Man, we, we've been going through Ephesians for a long time here, guys. I hope you don't mind that we don't four, usually do four-week series. We do usually do books of the Bible, and uh, I think this has been like a 21-week thing so far. Yeah. Anyway, we're, we're finally to the stand part. We talked earlier about sit. The first three chapters are about learning our position before God. So vitally important for every believer to understand that. Then we learned how to walk in that learning to submit to one another. Remember that? How to be continually filled with the Holy Spirit. And now we're gonna learn how to stand against the enemy because we've been placed in heavenly places. We've been placed at a great place, but the enemy wants to deceive us. So Paul starts in Ephesians 6.10 with this statement. Finally, be strong on your own. I got that wrong. Oh, yeah, that's the 21st century church. Uh, I was reading the wrong one. Um, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Now, what he's saying is there's a battle. There's a battle. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. So the devil has all these schemes. I don't know if you've understood that, but he is the king of propaganda. He's the king of lies. And man, they're all around us. I, lies are flying in our culture. And Paul then says this, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, against people, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Now that's bizarre. What does he mean by all those names? Friend, I wonder if you've ever read through the Old Testament yet. I, uh, I like to, when I, when I sit and have a meal with Jesus, um, I have my hors d'oeuvres first. I have Psalms and Proverbs, read those every day. And then I get to the main dish. And that is, I read through one Old Testament book and then one New Testament book. And, and I've been reading through 1 Samuel all about Saul and David, and, and now I'm finally up to Solomon. And hey, you know what I realized when I read the Old Testament? There's a whole lot of war. Like, man, if you're a typical American, you're going, what, what's the deal with this Old Testament? It's like so different from the New. Because the Old Testament is all about how God proves himself faithful in war. And, and you're just reading it going, for, for crying out loud, like why, why does there have to be so much blood? Uh, it is not G-rated. It's not, man. 
And yet when you get to the New Testament, Jesus comes as an agent of peace. But if you look closely, you see him casting out demons. What? Now, in 21st century America, we're going casting out demons? What? Now notice, back to our verse in Ephesians, what Paul calls these supernatural beings. He calls them rulers, authorities, cosmic powers over this darkness. He calls this earth the darkness. Isn't that interesting? So, so he seems to know of a place where it's light. They're the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Now, if you're, if you're a new to this thing, you're reading that and you're going, I didn't know that there was any evil in heaven. Well, the Bible really talks about three heavens. There's the heavens that are above us, like the clouds and the stars. And then there's the place where God dwells. That's his house. And then the heavenly places are where all sorts of spiritual forces, invisible forces, go to and fro. All right? And that's what he's referring to. So, I'd like to, I'd like to just read a passage to you, and if you're, if you're new to church, you're probably going to freak out. Th this is such a weird worldview. I don't know if you understand that the Bible has a supernatural worldview. Um, as Americans, we, we struggle with it a little bit. You know, the guy that wrote the, the Declaration of Independence, Thomas Jefferson, was what we call a theist, and he did not believe that there were any miracles ever. And so he went through the entire Bible and took out all of the supernatural aspects of the Bible. It was about, about eight pages long. That was a joke because the whole Bible is so full of supernatural things. And you can't hardly cover the life of Jesus and take out the supernatural things. It's just packed with supernatural. Now, Dr. Michael Heiser points out to us that for really centuries, the American church has kind of been blinded to this supernatural worldview. He says, when the Most High gave the nations their inheritance, when he divided mankind, he fixed the borders of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God. Now, that word in the Hebrew, bene Elohim, sons of God, is a reference to spiritual rulers. Through the rest of the Bible, they're called rulers, authorities. Oh, what we read in Ephesians. These are forces of spirituality that oversee each nation. Now, Deuteronomy 32 is a reference back to the Tower of Babel. I don't know if you ever heard the story of the Tower of Babel, but everybody was working together against God because there had just been a flood that destroyed the earth. And so everybody's going, man, we're going we're gonna to build a tower so that if God floods the world again, at least a few of us will be able to get to the high floors and not get drowned. So it says that they built it with baked bricks. That means that water won't hurt baked bricks. And they used tar as the, as the um, what do you put between mortar? Thank you. And, and uh, so they put tar in between the bricks. So man, this thing was a waterproof tower that they were gonna build up to the heavens. And God looked and said, man, everybody's united in rebellion against me. I'm going to scatter them. And so he scattered the people and gave them their own languages. And language, if you've ever learned much about culture, 
language is almost the definition of culture. And, and everybody went off to their own nation and he divided each nation and put an angelic or a supernatural deity in charge of each nation. Are you catching that? And when it first happened, they were people who were on his side. So he, he divided the people and put these deities in charge. Deuteronomy is basically telling us the true ruler of each nation is not a king, it's not a president, it's not a dictator, but rather something invisible. Spiritual beings dwelling in an unseen realm. That's what Paul says. So, what's interesting is if you study history, all of the cultures had their own gods. Now, what, what happened was these gods from Deuteronomy 32, we find out in Psalm 82 that they rebelled against God and God judged them. It's in Psalm 82. And what happened was um, there became these gods that the people began to worship. So if you look at Canaan, where the Israelites lived, there were gods like Baal and Asherah, Molech, and these gods were basically these angelic forces that ruled over the people. Are you with me? So it's pretty weird because Baal is, is the god of thunder and lightning, and in Greece, Zeus is the god of thunder and lightning, and in Rome, Jupiter is the god of thunder and lightning. Asherah was named Ishtar in Mesopotamia. The Greeks then called her Aphrodite. And in Rome, she became known as Artemis, who was also the goddess who was worshipped in Ephesus where this was written. Now, here's some really weird stuff about Artemis or Diana. Are you ready to just freak out? She was neither male nor female. I, I, I. She was the goddess of mothers and the goddess of women. And she believed that women didn't need a man. Where have we heard that? She taught that women can be great warriors like men. And men and women should be warriors together. Have you seen that in Hollywood at all? She was amorphous, meaning she was male and female. Molech was the god that people offered their children to. They would sacrifice their children in the fire to Molech. Does this sound familiar? So it's interesting because though these gods have been known to rule over nations, it seems like they migrate. Because it feels to me like these gods have come here. So Jesus and the New Testament writers had a worldview. Are you ready for this? When a person, a generation, or a country indulge in sin without repentance, they can be influenced by evil spirits. Now, when you read the books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you'll see Jesus casting demons out of people, and they'll say that these people are demon-possessed. That's the term we used. But in the Greek, it just means demonized. 
So demonized can be to a great extent, like the man that was called Legion. He had a whole over 600 demons inside of him. Or there were people who were ill or who couldn't hear or speak. And Jesus would cast out a demon and they could hear and speak then. So when we are demonized, it doesn't mean that we're taken over. It may mean that, but we are influenced by demonic forces. Now, this is all the supernatural worldview of the Bible. And this stuff we believe at this church is true, okay? Now, let me just read something that Jesus said. And you'll get what I mean from it in a minute. He said, when the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it passes through waterless places. People are about 75% water. So they, when, when they are cast out, they go out of them and they're going, I want to be inside another person. It passes through waterless places seeking rest, but finds none. Then it says, I will return to my house from which I came. You see, when... When Jesus casts the Spirit out of somebody, if they are repentant and they become followers of his, the house gets cleaned up, but the demon can't come back because now the Holy Spirit rules that joint, okay? But if they don't repent, if, if they're just grateful they got that demon out of them, but there's no transformation, then that demon says, I'll return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds the house empty, swept, and put in order. Then it goes and brings with it seven other spirits more evil than itself. And they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that person is worse than the first. And he's saying, well, Randy, that has to do with individuals. I thought we were talking about nations. Let's look at what he says is the last clause. So will it be with this evil generation. So this generation of Jews, after the great tearing away of most of the people to Babylon, came back to Israel. They tried to follow God wholeheartedly, but there was no real transformation on the inside of them. And Jesus said, because you have not been transformed on the inside, the demons are going to come back and they're going to affect this whole generation. I would like to say we are similar. In fact, I'll say this, America is a post-Christian nation. We were not ever a totally Christian nation. I, I, I'm not saying that. But we were profoundly influenced by the Christian ethic and by Christian worship. And we have pushed him aside. And it's the humble of many scholars and of this pastor that the enemy has come back in sevenfold strength. Paul kind of summarizes this by saying this, don't you realize that you become the slave of whatever you choose to obey? You can be a slave to sin, which leads to death, or you can choose to obey God, which leads to righteous living. So when a nation overall chooses not to obey God, but chooses to do what they want to do, then the enemy comes back sevenfold. Now, I'd like to clarify something here, guys. The God that rules my country will shape the worldview of my culture. And it's strong. It's magnetic. I wonder how many of you know somebody who grew up in a Christian home and has left the Christian faith. Right now, it's happening and mass. I have two sons 
that have joined that group. And it grieves my heart every day. I find about it, out about this every day from some of you. I find it out from pastor friends, find it out from people that I meet in, in the city. There are massive numbers of people leaving the faith. And it's primarily because this sevenfold enemy has come back and with this super powerful magnet just pulls people into a different worldview. Now, what is a worldview? A worldview is basically how a culturally generally views reality. <laughs> excuse, excuse me. Now, you may say, you may say that we live in a secular culture with a secular government. Dictionary.com defines secular like this, denoting attitudes, activities, or other things that have no religious or spiritual basis. So you may be thinking, we're not, we're not a, um, a religious culture. Our government has tried hard to say we're a secular government. Now, here's the biblical worldview. Are you ready? This is God's worldview. This will mess with you. God's worldview is that a nation cannot be governed by a secular worldview. There's always a God behind the worldview of every nation. Is that kind of news for some of you? Isn't that just bizarre? And if you think about it, it's true. Oh, we may be saying that we're a secular worldview. Have you seen Wall Street lately? Did you know that there's a giant bull in front of Wall Street? Did you know the shape of Baal was a bull? Are you aware of that? And we're, when the market's doing well, it's a bull market. We all think that what we see is what we see. You know? Like, it's just very clear. This is what I see. But the gods of my culture provide a lens through which I see reality. Have you ever thought of that? The gods of my culture provide a lens through which I see reality. So let me just show you a few things that the gods of our culture have superimposed on us. Are you ready? There's a focus on the material and a denial of the supernatural. If you've, if you've ever been sitting here in church and you just go, I don't know about that. That just seems far-fetched to me. It's because you've been propagandized by the gods of our culture that say, really what's real is what we can feel, taste, touch, and hear, but the supernatural is not real. And, and this speaks to all of us. Like, like a couple of weeks ago, I let you guys know that Sylvia Rodriguez, you know, when she got baptized on Easter, her back, which was she's supposed to go to surgery, her back was healed. And some of you are going, I don't know about that. And, and the reason you're thinking that is because you've been influenced. Another thing that they speak to us is hyper individualism. Just hyper individualism. So, how many of you have met somebody that says, Oh, yeah, I believe in Jesus. I just don't want, I don't like the church and I don't go to church because I don't need the church because I'm an individual and I don't need other people. And this is a great, great worldview from the enemy. Not a great one, a bad one. And it's all about me and I'll do my own thing. And I don't need other people. Our worldview says that our identity is rooted in sexual preference. 
not in Christ. I'm really a woman locked up in a man's body. I'm really a man locked up in a woman's body. You know what? This is, a, this, is this magnetic pull of the enemy. And if I just change my physical gender, I'll be happy. And this, is, this has been propagandized by our government, by our medical groups, and it's just propaganda, guys. I, and, and you may be angry with me, but don't shoot the messenger. There's a growing distrust for objective truth. Have you, heard, have you ever heard anybody say, um, I don't believe in absolute truth? And that right there is an absolute statement. They just made an absolute statement. It's weird. Our culture is so influenced by this. What is truth? It's just whatever you want it to be. That's your truth. I have my truth. You have your truth. Did, did you guys know that truth is a person? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And truth is found in a person named Jesus. Another part of the propaganda of the enemy is focusing on comfort. Um, we're about to go into a journey as a church, and I think the Holy Spirit is purposely bringing us to this place to get us uncomfortable. Shad and I love quoting this to each other. Did you know the Holy Spirit is the comforter of the afflicted and the afflictor of the comfortable? And if you're comfortable, just wait. If you follow Jesus, things are going to get uncomfortable. But we love our comfort, don't we? I, man, I'm the king of comfort. You ought to see, my, man, I've, I've got a lazy boy chair that I love to sit in. And that is, whew, that makes my day when I get to sit in that thing. I love my hot showers. Man, I, I love... I just love hugging my wife. That's comfortable. But did you know that if you follow Jesus, most of your life is determined beforehand that it won't be comfortable? Sorry. So it's kind of weird. When you live in an aquarium, you don't know that you live in an aquarium. Have you ever thought of that? So like we live in American culture and we don't realize how our culture is influenced. I remember many years ago, I went to Central Asia and it was still under the dominion of the Soviet Union. And I went into the grocery store and there was literally not a thing on the shelves. We walked out of the store and everybody is running. So Gay and I go, oh gosh, come on, let's run. See what's going on. Well, there were some guys that were selling black market fudge sickles out of the trunk of their car. Well, man, we were on it. <laughs> we got home and they didn't just have fudge sickles in the store. They had a hundred different kinds of ice cream bars. They didn't just have cereal, they had millions of kinds of cereal. Most people come from other cultures into our aquarium and they go, holy smokes, how do you people know what to buy? Those of you who are married, you grew up and thinking you had, man, what a great house I live in. And then you get married and your spouse begins to point out things about your family. And you're going, I, I didn't know this about my family. What? Have you, like, all you married people are giggling because you're realizing, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, it's because you were in an aquarium and then you brought somebody else in and they go, this is a weird aquarium. 
Have you noticed that? So, so I, I, I'm sure that I've probably made a lot of you uncomfortable, and that's what the Holy Spirit's all about today. All right? I, I just want you to be uncomfortable, and I want you to be a little, like, if you're a little angry with me, and if you're, if you're sitting there saying, I don't know about that, then will you please, with an open mind, begin to question your own worldview? Will you join me in prayer? Holy Spirit, God, we just invite you to change our hearts, change our view. You said if any of you lacks wisdom, the ability to see the world from your perspective, let him ask of God and he will give it to him liberally. So we ask you for your perspective today. Would you open our eyes and give us perspective? Hmm. I wonder if there's anybody here that would raise their hand to me and say, Randy, I, I feel convicted today that I've just been a victim of the gods of this culture. And I want to make Jesus my Lord and Savior. And I, I just by faith want to just follow him today. That's all, I, that's all it is, is just by faith. I just say, Jesus, I want to follow you. If that's you, would you mind raising your hand for me? Thank you. Anybody else? Let's just pray together. Lord, I just, I just know I've been taken captive by the God and gods of this culture. And today, I, I just want to swim against the flow and I want to follow Jesus. I know it's just such a different worldview to follow you. But I lay down my old life and I thank you that you forgive me of all of my sin. Everything I've ever done in the past, everything I ever will do. Oh, thank you that you cleanse me. And I invite you to make me a new person today. I want to be your follower. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.